Okay, well, um, I'd say, you know, we're waiting for Brad, and Josh might not be joining us, but Brian, you can go ahead and give uh, your presentation if you want. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And uh, just really quick, this is kind of a new format. We're, we're starting at a new time. We're going to try and keep it under 30 minutes. Hey, Brad. Hey. Oh, hey. Perfect, Brad. We're on air. Hey. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Brian was just about to give his presentation on CAN route map, and that'll be like a five to ten minute presentation. And then uh, and after that, we'll just kind of have some open dialogue between you guys on uh, routing, web application routing best practices and, and things to stay away from. And maybe answer a uh, How do you feel for, for Brad? Or Brad, what, were, were you going to talk about anything? Or uh, Yeah, I was going to talk about... Um, the early challenges we had using CanJS and, and how we've fixed them or what things have gotten better since uh, 113 for people who may not have uh, tried CanJS recently. Cool. Um, um, yeah, there's lots of changes, and, and all of them have been for the better. That's, that's but, good to know. Um, Chris, how do you feel? Sorry. Sorry. Go on. I was going to say, I see a lot of stuff coming up on the forums that is stuff that I've already solved once. And so, like, I feel like I just want to, like, data dump everybody. It's like, here, here's libraries you can use. Figure out, you know, just take the stuff I figured out already. Um, I'm not sure if the talk is the right way to, to uh, implement that, but uh, I want to tell everybody that there's lots of, uh, lots of stuff that users have solved, and it's, it's out there in, in open source in some cases. Uh, so they should definitely, like, poke around and ask questions, but, um, you know, keep asking because you'll probably find out that somebody has had your issue before. Chris, how do you feel about having Brad first? I wanted to ask you that earlier, but I forgot. <laughs> that, that works fine for me. Um, yeah, I'd say let's you know do five, ten minutes with you, Brad, and then uh, we'll move on to Brian, and then just kind of chat about routing after that. Sounds okay. Good. Yeah. Cool. Sounds good. Let's do this. Uh, and also probably jump back and forth between that and my text editor, um, and also my browser. I want to think. Well, first of all, I actually want to sc uh, screen share here. That would be important. All right. Now David sees himself. Uh, let's jump over here. Uh, so essentially, we have here the uh, the the app I've been working. On currently at reciprocity Inc. for for quite a while, and this is uh, this is actually uh, Google's uh, governance risk and compliance management system. Uh, it is an Apache licensed app. Uh, if you want to, if you really have an organization big enough that you need to start uh, comparing your business assets and systems against everything you have to comply with, uh, you can you should definitely look this up. Uh, it is under current rapid development. We're adding in new features on a pretty frequent basis now. Um, I just want to, you know, cover the, the fact that it's not actually a single page app. So routing, it does not figure much into this at the moment. Um, but we have lots of interesting challenges with this just because of the nature of the business case for it. That's what, uh, a lot of what I wanted to go over. Um, but first of all, I just want to say that uh, for those who don't know, uh, I've been working with Batovi products for three and a half years now. Uh, I started in 2010 uh, and have worked with Justin and Brian and Alexis, and uh, they've all been great people, and they've helped me out a lot in learning how to be really great at JavaScript and also at working with their own products in, in particular. Uh, you know, but I got to see the difference between using like pre-live binding, pre-mustache uh, JavaScript MVC versus what we have now. It's so much better. Um, currently, the reciprocity GGRC app is on version uh, 207 of CanJS, so things that I talk about here may actually be slightly out of date. Um, but like, I, you know, we hope to move to 2.1 whenever I can actually uh, squeeze that time blocks out of management. Uh, so a few things I wanted to say about early on when we started with uh, CanJS like 113, and this was about to I'd say the 113 to 116. Uh, era, we had uh, some really bad bugs with with live binding, like changing null values to non-null seemed to never work, and so we'd always have to have things like empty lists as default. 
Um, and it was really hard to inform Live Mining that we wanted to actually like run a, a helper again whenever a particular attribute changed. These are both way better now since we have CanView Live, we have Mustache Resolve works reliably, um, and computing on the scope is uh, is so much better in, in terms of catching all of those changes that we want to reflect in the Live Mining sections. Um, we also had uh, some problem deferring render, uh, and this is particular to our uh, to our app for reasons that I'll get into in a moment. Uh, also better now. Um, we had a messy model inheritance uh, model only because, well, it's actually us that has the messy model inheritance. Uh, in our Python source, we use a lot of mixins, and a single model class can have like eight parents. JavaScript style inheritance, which is a single inheritance system, uh, we have started sparingly using mixins, using our own mixin library. Uh, this is uh, important, I think, because I've seen other people kind of want this, this functionality. Uh, we have implemented it. It only works currently with models and not all observes or constructs, uh, but I think it could be uh, extended pretty easily to handle everything in that, uh, in that scope. Um, and also, we started using a lot of extra thing uh, headers with REST, uh, which are not normally handled with uh, $AJAX, so we just have a, a pre-filter that adds in those tags. It keeps a, a, a store of uh, separate from the, the model layer, and then reapplies them whenever we go to update and create new, new uh, items. Oh, right, that's just a... Sorry, work thing. Um, but one of the biggest problems that we've had uh, that is actually not perfectly resolvable using uh, native CAN stuff is that our object graph is massively connected. Uh, so if you look back here, like all these types of, uh, of items uh, can pretty much connect to one or more of any other type that you see here. Uh, there are exceptions, but the default state is pretty much if you see two objects here, they can be connected somehow. So what happens is, what happened in early on was that we would get super super massive slowdown because a change trigger could possibly bubble up all the way through the object graph and touch almost everything in it. Um, so what we've actually done to address this is create a um, a stub reference system where essentially the um, when you when you have an object that's a can model and it references another object that's a can model it doesn't do so directly. So we actually create a like a sort of like a lookup entry, uh, which we call a stub, and it has ID and type, and href. So you can actually go back through um, through the rayify function on the stub, which gives you back the original object. Or um, we all, if you're in a you know a mustache, we have a, a suite of helpers that help us actually do that and defer rendering until they're uh, defined and uh, synced from the server. Uh, biggest, uh, one of the most annoying problems that I had, and this is not actually Can's fault, um, was trying to work with things like uh, jQuery UI autocomplete. Uh, what is this? There we go. That's what I was looking to say there. Um, what we actually had to do was uh, write a lot of different components around uh, autocomplete, and I think I actually show you this. Uh, so essentially down here, uh, to actually get autocomplete to play nice with CanJS, we had to uh, overwrite the change function. The well, the source is just source, um, and the and actually have every Can controller that was interested in uh, listening on autocompletes provide a select function. Uh, and also, of course, because I'm kind of, I, I was sort of forward-looking about this, I overrode render menu to actually use can view. So we could actually provide type-specific autocomplete result uh, templates that would let you see things with the appropriate fields filled out, et cetera, et cetera. It was actually kind of cool when that worked. Uh, but getting it to work was annoying just because uh, usually I'd like type something in, select it, and then the field would be blank. Um, 
that we've actually figured out. Uh, mostly, I think it has to do with uh, waiting on trying to change things with a little bit of a timeout in between. Uh, and also, since we are a Google product, uh, there are things that we're doing with Google API. Uh, so you can actually see, I uh, can't actually show you at the moment because I'm working on this particular thing. Uh, but we actually have uh, models in, in CanJS, in some cases, connecting to drive folders. Uh, and so they're linked through these sort of connection models that go from one particular piece of the uh, of this information on the left to some folder on Drive uh, that contains usually like audit evidence information. And it's uh, and what that means is that because you know connecting through uh, to G Drive or any other Google product requires their G API and not um, uh, can.ajax, that doesn't quite work as you'd hope. Um, you actually need to make sure that your OAuth tokens have been refreshed through the authorization process, and then you also have to sort of defer through their uh, their own uh, methods for accessing the live data with callbacks instead of deferreds. Uh, having can deferred available really is a, a huge help here. Um, so those are the, th the things that I thought were major that we've had to work through at like a very core level. Um, some new stuff that I'd actually, I'm going to turn off screen sharing now, because uh, that was pretty much all I had to say. Uh, the new stuff that I actually had to say, uh, had to get Uh, like see, see happening is better support for animation. Uh, I know that there's a huge opportunity here for like deferring a state change between when your data actually, your data layer changes and when your view layer actually has like a certain final result to it. Uh, and essentially having like okay, data layer changes. Here's our initial state, and this is the final state we want to actually have that that comes after it uh, with you know transitions and, and such. Um, I think that would actually be really great for having slick UI in cases because it will be stash helpers that fade in and fade out. Uh, but I always feel like they're a little bit like hacky and non-reusable. Um, and the same same goes for for toggling and, and such. Um, so I've only recently been adding things like can component based stuff for obvious reasons. Like we started so early on this that most everything is handled around giant controls. Uh, we're not really using like can dash value or or can dash event yet in in terms of views. Um, these things will be happening in the future as, as I look at it and say, well, I could the old way, which would be compatible with our old system, but it takes forever and I'd hate my job. Or I could just like you know bite the bullet, learn how to do it the new fresh way, and then probably save myself a ton of time in in the process. Uh, and that's it. I mean, that's you know that that's our current state. There's you know we've come a really long way. You guys have come a really long way at Batovi, and we certainly have a reciprocity in terms of making like really awesome polished products. Um, and I'm so happy to be working with it for you know for the time being at least. And uh, that's that's my talk. Back to you guys. Um, thanks so much. I have a quick question. Um, with the autocomplete and integration of third-party plugins in general, was there features that you guys needed that wasn't where you said it would take too long to actually implement it yourself, kind of, or? Uh, possible it would take too long to implement it myself. I really hadn't scoped the, the process of doing that. I just always assumed that it will. Like, I think that usually trying to adapt existing libraries that have been tested and address them already is probably going to be better on my time if I have to just adapt or shim that code than if I completely wrote it whole cloth. But there are still some cases where I had like date packers and unpackers and, and such that really um, I couldn't find something that was small that did the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 that makes sense. I just remember that I ran into situations myself where I was trying for like three days to get it working and then said, oh, I just try, you know, to implement exactly what I need, and that took like a day and a half. So um, I was just curious what the experience 
was with trying to adapt things. Because it's always difficult, I guess, in whatever environment, to in trying to include something that's a third party that doesn't know your your stack, kind of. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, I know my stack, and usually what happens is whenever I, I have a third party thing that doesn't know my stack, I just have to learn the third party thing really well. Mm-hmm. And then it starts to, and then you can kind of see where the pain points are and, and smooth things out between them. Yeah, usually components Although, are. Although, what did you say? With the autocomplete, it was definitely a lot of trial and error uh, to make oh, okay. it reflect the current value and, and such. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it's it's. Great. I'm, I'm grateful that it's all open source because if this were like a box product and I can only find it minimized, I'd never be able to pull this off. Yeah, I, I've found that um, with wrapping third-party components, component can component is very useful because you can kind of abstract away the API so the other people using that autocomplete can just treat it like any other component and pass computes in and expect it to do the same. But you can abstract away, you know, the, the third-party API that way. Cool. Well, thanks, Brad. That was really cool. Thanks, Brad. You're welcome, everyone. All right. Am I next? Yep. Okay. Let me share my screen. Uh, everybody else can mute, too, while uh, Brian talks. Okay. So I want to give a quick demo about um, can route map. Um, I've built, well, adapted a, a demo application that I worked on with Eli a while ago to, to 212, and it uses uh, define and components and everything. And it's a pretty cool demo for some reasons I'll show in a second. Um, it's a, it's pretty simple, so it's just a, oops, oh, that's the wrong, here's the local one. Um, it's just a, uh, a TPS report viewer. Um, basically, it has a form that has a, a search field where you can enter a name, um, a report list component, and then a flags component that you can select flags to show for to just filter the, um, the, the, the visible component, the visible reports. So what's interesting about this is that um, it's three components. So here's the top level uh, stash file. So it's just uh, a grouping of a search filter, a flag filter, and a report list. Um, and it uses this top level app state observable object. So this app state is a, is a CAM map that I'll show in a second. Um, it, it, Passes, I'll, I'll get to this part, this is where the demo is in a second, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, it passes the app state into that top level app template. And then there's three properties of the template that are of use to these different, um, to these different uh, components. So there's the search term, there's the flags, and then there's the reports. So reports are the list of all the visible reports. Flags are the flags you selected, and search term is the, the string. Um, and so each of those things, what's, what's cool about this is that there's actually no event handlers anywhere in the application. This is all just wired up data via computes and can value. Um, so the flag filter, the component looks like this. It's just a tag and a template. Report list looks like this. It's just a tag and a template and one helper. And then search filter is just a tag and a template. So let me show those templates. Um, the report list just renders the reports property. And each of them have a name, and then formats the flags, which is what is shown on the right here. Um, and then it cross binds the the value selected, the selected property of each report to the checkbox. Um, the search filter just cross binds with can value the search term property of its scope um, to the value of that input. And the search term property again was passed in to via the attribute uh, search term from the app state. So let me show the app state next. So app state, this is the this in this file we're just defining the constructor function, then we instantiate it in the like the app level index file here. So this instantiates a, a new instance of app state. We do that for unit testing, so you can unit test this this um, this constructor. Uh, so using define, I'm defining right now just three different properties. There's a reports property, and it's gonna just be it, it, it has a getter that just returns a new reports list. Um, passing the search term is the is the param for that. So this is just going to make a final request for reports um, and, and get back and anything that matches the search term. Uh, there's also flags property, which is just going to get all the flags from, from a service. I'll show those in a second. And then there's a search term, which 
value, the value property is uh, just what you initialize it to, which is going to be an empty string at first. Um, so right now, what's happening is um, we're instantiating app state, and then I'm calling can route map to to cross bind to to make the internal can route uh, can map equivalent to the app state can map. So what this means is that the properties that are set via the hash are going to be cross bound back to the uh, the app state object, and the app state anything that's programmatically changing the app state property properties will be reflected in the in the router. So that means that I can kind of easily capture the um, the state of the page in, in the hash without really doing any extra work. All I have to do is kind of define the um, the app state, and then that app state is passed in, its various properties are passed into the components, and those bind to changes in those properties. So that's why there's no event handlers. All that has, all that ever has to happen is the properties of app state have to change, and then the components will reflect those changes. So we call can route map and pass app state in. Call can route ready to instant, to initialize the the can route. Um, data that, that'll read the hash and start um, populating the, the properties and firing the event handlers. And then I'm rendering this initial template into the, into the app div with the app state passed in. Um, so I've got, a, I've got a couple of simple models for reports and flags. Reports is just, um, just a get request to reports. Flags is just a get request, request to flags. And I've got a fixture for each. So reports fixture is just uh, a little bit more interesting. It's just um, doing some logic to filter based on the flags that were passed and the name that was passed. Um, so what I want to show, what I, there's like one part I want to kind of live code. Um, so this actually all works right now. So if I type in, for example, funky and hit enter, it's going to make a search using fixtures um, to get that, that list of reports, and it's just going to show that, that matching report. So the way that works, if we follow the kind of event chain of events, um, so going back to the search filter, this can value ties the search term um, to the input. So if I change the input, and 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 uh, then that will change the search term, and then the search term um, is passed in again via this attribute here. That attribute, I'm just kind of walking up the stack, so to speak. Um, so the the index.stash right here is, um, when we render it with app template is the AMD argument. Um, it's passing in the app state, so that's where, where that comes from. And then when app state changes, going back to, or when, uh, when search term changes, search term is, uh, we express interest in search term in this getter, and because we're rendering reports inside of a template, this is wrapped in a compute. So whenever the search term property changes, this reports uh, knows it has to change and recalculate its value. So that will cause the getter to rerun, and that will get a new new list of uh, reports. So again, in in reports list, we're just rendering the list of reports, and that was again passed in via the the top level template index.stash right here. So that's just passing in reports. So where can route map comes in is, is keeping track of all this via this, the, um, the hash. I think I'm running a little short on time, so let me get to the demo part. Um, so in, uh, in define, you can, you can tell define which properties you want to serialize and how they should serialize and how, if they shouldn't serialize. So we don't want reports to be serialized, meaning it shouldn't show up in the URL. So we, we set reports property serialize, serialize property to false. Same with flags. That's just a list of all the flags that we have. We don't want that to serialize. Search term does serialize. So if I enter a search term here, like strange, uh, that'll show up in the URL. If I hit back, that'll trigger a change in the app state, which will repopulate that list. So, but what if I what, what I want to do is now um, implement the flags feature. So right now, flags doesn't work. It doesn't doesn't hook up to anything. So to get that to work. Um, I need to I need to pass flags to the service here. So we're gonna we're gonna pass something in, but first I want to create a, a property that represents the selected flags in the URL. So to do that, we're gonna create a virtual property that shows the flags that the user has selected that looks like this a comma b. So we'll call that selected flags.
Um, that's going to have a getter. It's gonna so the getter is just going to be derived from the value of the flags property. So the flags, each each flag instance has a selected property. Um, let me show that. So in this, in this flag filter stash file, we're cross binding each flag selected property to that the checkbox. So whenever I check it, that selected property should should become true. So to to represent that in like a comma separated stream, all I need to do is just iterate over, get get a list of selected flags. So that's just this dot adder flags. A filter, there's a new filter function in, in two one. It's just kind of a like the underscore map. Um, so that's going to be passed to each individual flag. And I can say return flag dot adder selected. And then I'm just going to turn that into a list of IDs. So for IDs equals, I'll just use underscore for this method. Um, so selected flags. Actually, we're using lodash, same thing. Selected flags ID, and then return IDs dot join comma. So that's how we get the um, that's how we get that's how we implement the getter for selected flags. And the can route uh, serializer will use the getter. Sorry, that should be serialized, not get. That's how we define how this property serializes into the URL, um, and then. When when the user hits back, or if, if a deep link is used, and um, that property is set in can route, uh, that will call the setter. So we want to define basically how setting the selected flags property maps back to the real values in flags. Because keep in mind, this is what we're calling a virtual property. This this data isn't really real, so to speak. The real data is kept in flags, but we're not serializing flags because it's a list. So we have to define how to map that back. So to do that, we just kind of do the reverse. So we're going to be called with a, a list of IDs. Um, so we want to we want to split that list of IDs. So IDs array equals IDs dot split on the comma, and then uh, let me just grab my cheat sheet because I'm running low on time here. I'll explain this in a second. OK, so we split on the comma. Then we go through the list of flags. And for each flag, we just check to see if um, that flag's name is part of the array that we were passed. So this, this array is going to be something like A, comma, B. So when we split it, it's going to have the values A and B. And if the, the value is in the list, then we set that flag selected property to true. Otherwise, we set the flag selected property to false. Um, and then the last thing I want to do is, is fix this uh, this request here. This this is the params that are sent to find all. So we want to fix that request so that it actually sends the, the correct value. So one way to do that is I'm just going to say um, this dot define dot selected. Oops. So I want this to be you know similar to the format used in the serializer. So I'm just going to call the serializer directly. Selected flags that serialize dot apply. Pass in there. Um, oh yeah, it does matter actually because it uses this. Okay, so hopefully that works. Let me see. Syntax error. Uh oh. I think you forgot a comma, comma somewhere uh, down below. Yep. Cool. After selected flags, I think it was just that extra semicolon. Oh, maybe you're right. Line 50. Oh, I forgot a comma. So 48, I think. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing you notice is selected flag shows up and it's empty because when this flag list populates, all the, the, the selected properties are initialized to false, so there are no flags. But when I select a flag, Nothing happens. It didn't work. <laughs> it flashed, so it's doing something. Um, let's see. Let's 
So the URL isn't being populated either. Okay, so that, that method's not working. Maybe I wrote it wrong. Scratch sheet. Oh, it's the name property, not the IDs property. That was the issue. So the flags, sorry, the data structure for the flags are, um, each of them have a name property, that's it. They don't have an ID. So let me change that to name. Probably should be ID, but this, this will work for now. All right, there we go. Cool, so now when I select A, you'll see a few things happen. Um, that's gonna cause, again, through the can value binding, the selected property is gonna be true. Through the, the um, serializer, now that's gonna show A in the selected flags list. And then that's gonna trigger a change event on reports, which means it's gonna run its getter, which means it's gonna make another Ajax request to get the new list of reports with the new list of flags. So if I click B, that shows up in the, in the selected flags. This is an inclusive filter, so if I, I go back here, so this is just all the things with A. This is all the things with A and C. These are all the things with A, B, and C. I can type funky. And what's, what's, I guess, what the interesting part about this and how this ties into can route map is that um, we implemented our app state. We kind of declared you know, all the relationship between all the data called can route map to, to cross bind that to the hash and then now we have hash support for, for our app state. Um, so I can click back and it's going to remove that search term. If I click back again it's going to add a selected flag um, so the, the state of this URL is now in sync with my application. So that's it. Any questions? Are you going to put that online, the demo? Yeah, um, I was actually running a, finishing up a, a tutorial about it. I'm going to publish that, and it's actually um, right here. This is the, uh, this is the wrong branch. It's in. There. Okay, well, cool. When, uh, when the tutorial gets done, we'll, we'll post it up for everybody, too. Um, we're running low or over on time, uh, and we promised a couple of web application routing best practices. So just wondering if uh, David and Brian if maybe one, one or both I, of you I, want to hit a, uh, a quick, you know, best and worst pra practice of uh, web routing. I just quickly wanted to talk about the difference, how CanJS is doing routing and how um, routing in, like, server-side frameworks is usually done. So maybe I can minutes for that. Yeah, that'd be um, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna share my. I should, I'm gonna share my screen, and um, because usually, how routing is done, how many of you are used to routing being done in web application frameworks is something you you have your router. Um, I hope everybody can see my screen, and then you define like some route. ID and then you register a callback with the data um, when this route is being hit. So this is a pretty the pr the common way of doing it. Um, but much like life binding is changing the way you have to think about how to structure your application your application state. Let's say with life binding, instead of saying, okay, somebody clicks a button, now I have to do this jQuery selector and change the color of this element. You just say, I'm registering that button click, and then I'm going to update my state and add the color that I want to, and then that color change triggers some other CSS properties that change. This is kind of almost the same idea for how routing works for us. So this is kind of the old way of doing it. And how can route works is it always has some kind of a state object. So some one, it's not necessarily a mistake, but one thing I see very often um, that people get stumped on is something like this. And then you want to do something like users ID. Now, this is uh, for the usual routing. 
how you used to. That's how that's how it works, right? But what we actually want to do with can route is we want a section and an ID so that we can listen to both changes. So we can listen to section section changes and ID changes. So um, this is the route we actually have to define if you want to listen to two dif different sections. Uh, the cool thing that we can do now, though, is I registered a little helper here um, that helps actually quite a bit. I'm hoping we have actually been talking about making something like that part of the core because what we can do is with the is helper saying this. So the current. ID. Application structuring in your views based on the routes your or your application state in general. Hey David, I think we lost you for a few seconds. I think when you're typing, it's automatically muting you. Oh yeah, I think it is. I don't know how we can turn this off. Shit. Um, I don't think that's a setting you can turn off. <laughs> Just talk when you're not typing. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually used to typing and talking at the same time, so I'm going to try not to. All right, so, so we can do things like this, which is pretty neat because a lot of our structure of how, what our application is showing in what state is actually now going into our templates versus you have your route listeners and then you have to do all your setup and tear down in that route listener. So what, what I want to do here is uh, set, uh, make a state object, our global state object, because Brian showed it already, it's new can.map. And then we can that view into the content, so we say, Sorry, I'm typing and talking at the same time. Um, so we, now we get a render of you into the content. So we rendered. Um, we rendered our our state object in there. So. Um, all we got to do for now, for the rest, is actually say, and then I'm, I made two links up here, one to blog one and one to user 23. Um, let's make sure users and blog. So once I run this and I update this, nothing happens. Of course, nothing happens. It's so, so much fun to name things that didn't happen. Well, you always need a cheat sheet. I did, yeah, I forgot my cheat sheet. <laughs> but but we'll, we'll, definitely, we'll definitely figure it out. Um, so content, HTML, can view, mustache. I should have made a cheat sheet, but it was but it wasn't too too much time. Did we do can route ready state? Does anybody see see a mistake? Not yet. So my is helper helper did work, so I actually tried that out. <laughs> oh wait. Um we, I didn't, I, like you see up here, it doesn't have. Lose David? In, to actually load belongs to it. So this is pretty powerful. It just, it, it's just a little bit of a paradigm shift. Um, the same way life binding is compared to doing all your glue code manually using jQuery, uh, the routes in CanJS are kind of the same way different than traditional routing from like web application frameworks. Just keep in mind that you have your application state and your route contains your application state and you want to 
deal with the application state, not with specific routes. And think, yeah, that's just quickly what I wanted to show. I think that's a good analogy. I think that's true that that um, it's it's analogous to you know live binding versus DOM manipulation. And I think yeah. I think that like um, when you're used to you know hash or pattern based routing, what happens in a pattern based route event handler is you do DOM manipulation or, or kind of render a template, do something manually. It's kind of like a more linear progression of here's what happens, then this happens, this happens, as opposed to kind of elevating your thinking to the level of the data. And this is similar to live binding in that it elevates your thinking to the level of the data, and you don't have to really live on the level of, um, of you don't have to think about the DOM at all. With, with pattern-based routing, you, you still think about the DOM. Yeah, I think that's that. That's we can keep the discussion on that because that was the most important point that I wanted to bring across. I don't even want to talk about worst practices or anything. I just think if you approach it this way, routing will become a lot more accessible to you. Like even to me, I had the same problem. So um, it's probably worth writing an article about too. <laughs> So yeah, I think that's that's it for for me at least for today though. For for me at least for today though. Perfect. Thanks, David. Uh, Brian, anything to add or want to call? Uh, 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 this talk. Talk. Uh, oh. Oh. Here's the feedback. feedback. So was that Brian? I'm muting. I'm muting you while I while we, I talk. Uh, do, are we going to do anything with uh, like going over issues today, or is that a different meeting? I don't know if that's what we want to cover here. I think we might want to leave it at that today. Yeah, we had a plan to, to go over any questions that were asked, but none were asked, and we're running uh, a bit over time. So I think we'll just call it a wrap for today. OK, sounds okay. good. Sounds good. Brad, thanks, thanks, for that, thanks, thanks guys. That was really thanks, informative. Guys, that was really informative. Awesome. Thanks, Brad. Uh, we'll also be thanks, posting Brad. this up onto YouTube, so if anybody wants to go back and uh, watch the details, uh, it'll be available there. So, thanks a lot, everybody, and uh, see you next week. Bye.